Hi, and welcome back to another reading. Today we're going to be reading from the Ledge of Creation. Uh, we're going to be reading Chapter 12, one of my favorites from the Sh uh, Shut's Hap. So, begin now. My word, that was exciting, Mother Nature said as she flopped back down on her chair, unseen under hovering cloud. The ever-present Frangle agreed. Frangle, I think this chair is missing a cushion. Do be a dear and get me one. Frangle scuttled across the cloud and opened a covered door that was white and fluffy like the cloud. He reappeared with a blue cushion. No, not that one. I want the green one. Frangle dropped his head. Life would be a lot easier if he was telepathic, he thought, as he went to change the cushion. Who won? Ah, woo, Reg howled. Bernard was grinning like a solicitor chasing an ambulance as his teammates and the rest of the peloton crew crawled over the finishing line, all except Box, who was still a good 30 minutes away. Ah, uh, woo, well done. I shall sacrifice a chicken in your name. Earth, thanks, I think, said Bernard. Woo, well done, Bernard, said Stan, and in his excitement, he performed a 30 sit-ups without realizing it. A fart resonated in the air as Barry wandered into the crowd of cyclists. Almost had you, Bernard, he said, shaking his hand. Almost, said Bernard with a laugh. Colin broke a fresh baguette in half. The crack was deafening and waved it in triumph for Bernard. Austin readjusted his glasses and shook Bernard's hand. Interesting way to win a race. However, when you threw your bike, was it your intention to hit that marshal? In his eagerness to win, Bernard hadn't noticed that his bike had wrapped itself around a young marshal called Administrator Owlet, a skinny, long-haired hippie who had a tendency to be a bit vague. The result of a little experimentation with substances frowned upon by Mother Nature that had left him a little hazy. So when a top-of-the-range Bianchi bicycle smashed into his lower body and groin, it took several minutes, moments for his brain to respond before he eventually muttered, Groovy, and fell over. Horrified, Bernard looked around and spotted Administrator Allard holding his bike and singing a song to himself. Bloody hell, I'm sorry. Allard looked up with a glazed look in his eye. Why, ma'am? Bernard looked confused. I threw my bike at you. It must have hurt. Uh, did you? Oh, man, no problem, man. I'm okay. Is this thing yours? Ella pointed to the bike. Er, yes, it is. May I have it back? Ella blinked. Yeah, sure thing, man. Once everyone had finished congratulating Bernard, Barry suddenly came became aware of the temperature. It's bloody freezing up here. Looks like it's going to snow. Standing a few meters away and slightly out of sight, Team Captain Derek Dakerson watched as Cogs and Clocks celebrated. He felt a mixture of pride and a weird urge to eat a power gel. The barren, rocky summit of the Col de Grincho lay open and exposed. Razor-like rock teeth formed an alien landscape that stretched across the horizon, providing a fascinating backdrop to the summit. A strong, biting wind swirled around the riders, chilling their bones. It was at this point that Administrator Basil, a bald, gangly man with a thin mustache that crawled along his top lip, swooped out of the only building on the summit. He stood there for a moment and adjusted his round glasses and his odd array of clothing, a beige suit, beige shirt, beige pants, and beige shoes. The sea of bland, however, was broken by a bright green tie that clashed terribly. His suit fought the tie and like two prominent MPs from either side of the political scale, one left-wing nutter and one right-wing lunatic. Basil appeared to be slightly unsure of himself, and he belched in excess of what could be considered normal. Looking across at the shivering teams, he gestured that they should come inside. The teams gratefully accepted his offer. After crossing a wooden drawbridge, they fouled through two huge oak doors that led into a magnificent reception area. A glass chandelier swayed as the wind charged around the entrance. Huge paintings of landmarks were scattered across the walls between metal candles, 
cradles that held burning torches which flickered in the wind. Oh, what's a castle hotel? Reg cried out in excitement. I always wanted to stay in a castle. Administrator Basil turned to inquire what all the howling was about. But Zodiac patted him on the shoulder, shook his head, and urged him to keep going. The teams passed through a second set of huge oak doors and entered the main hall. Both sets of doors closed behind them. A ferocious fire danced in the gargantuan fireplace. The heat was appreciated by everyone. Above the mantelpiece hung more pictures of landmarks, but above the smaller pictures hung the centerpiece. A huge portrait of Mother Nature that filled most of the wall. To the left of the fireplace, a temporary stage had been erected. It was here that Bernard was paraded as a stage winner and where he accepted his winner's medal as well as a kiss from two fine-looking female administrators. Later that evening, after everyone had washed and changed, the main evening meal was served in a huge hall. Three long wooden tables, which ran almost the whole length of the hall, easily accommodated the three teams. Directly under the huge portrait of Mother Nature, and far enough away from the roasting fireplace, sat at the top table which spanned the width of the hall, sitting on the top sitting at the top table were the team administrators and the team captains. Mother Nature sat in the middle with Frangle up to her left, who tried in vain to rearrange Mother Nature's cushions as she struggled to find any comfort on the hard wooden chairs. It was, of course, his fault. Waiters flooded in and out of double doors that led to the castle kitchens. One door marked in and the other marked out. For reasons known only to Mr. Basil, he was standing in a box holding a microphone and shouting orders at everyone at once. Needless to say, it didn't work, and to make matters worse, he occasionally burped into the amplifier. Waiters spun and crashed into one another as they hurried back and forth, trying to keep up with his commands. Mother Nature, displeased with the lack of organization, glared at Basil, chilling him to his soul. Seeing her disapproval, Basil knew he had to act fast, and with the impulse and snap reactions of a railway manager, he screamed louder at a waiter who was scuttling by his, under his nose. Under the barrage of Basil's lifted onslaught, the unfortunate attendant turned in shock, not looking where he was going. With his back to the double doors, the unlucky waiter stepped back towards the kitchen, about to commit the ultimate catering sin. Watching in complete horror, Colin sprang up out of seat, his chef senses going into overdrive and shouted, No! You never go through the outdoor when you're going in, just as you never go through the indoor when... And then he, the inevitable happened. Colin was a chef by nature, and being a chef meant that certain conventions had been bestowed upon him or rather hammered into his head. He watched in disbelief as chaos ensued, resulting in food, plates, and cutlery making their final voyage through time and space and smashing upon the stone floor. The incident ignited the fuse of the height-restricted head chef, whose temper was fragile at the best of times, and the angry little man stormed out of the kitchen through the outdoor, his small round face as red as a baboon's arse. Epping hell, he screamed at the two waiters who were both sprawled out on the floors, covered in food and wine. You epping idiots! And the mad little chef weighed a meat cleaver randomly and aggressively in the air. Shaking his head, the large, muscular head waiter pushed up his sleeves, walked up to the head chef, and took hold of him by his chef's whites. The chef blew a gasket. Oh, why, and what do you want? The head chef screamed, his tall chef's hat wobbling as he struggled to contain himself. You don't talk to my waiters using that tone, the head waiter calmly replied. Burning with an uncontrollable rage, the little chef with a big mouth turned a deeper shade of purple <coughs> and erupted. Oh, really? And what's the effing are you going to do about it? And he swung a fist. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, I do apologize. Uh, 
The resulting scuffle, which was enveloped in a cloud of dust, arms and legs, momentarily appeared with a bit and a thud, unoppressed and, un and annoyed at such commotion from a professional kitchen. Colin Collinson rolled up his sleeves, grabbed a megaphone from Basil, who meekly protested, and had ordered him down from the, his box. He then sidestepped the babbling head chef and head waiter and pushed open the correct door that led into the kitchen. Colin was going in. Administrator Basil remained motionless and speechless as the battle outside the kitchen rolled on. He burped and then remembered it was his hotel and tried to intervene with polite words. After his fleeting entreaties of please stop fighting the on deaf ears, Basil slid in to the kitchen and turned to a softer target and remonstrated with Colin, who he felt was overstepping his authority. Basil was about to attempt to remove Colin from his kitchen when Mother Nature called out from across the great hall. Administrator Basil, please come and sit with us. It was a command, not a request. And Basil understood it instantly and obeyed. I do believe your kitchen is in safe hands, Mother Nature assured him as he approached the top table. Don't you agree, Frango? Yes, Mother Nature. I hear Mr. Collinson is a very good chef. Excellent. You see, Mr. Basil, everything will be fine. Basil grunted slightly, reluctantly pulling up a chair and sat down, feeling distinctly uncomfortable. But it's my hotel, he protested. Yes, it is, was all Mother Nature nature would say, and she gave Basil a look that suggested he would be wise to end the protest at once. Catching a pleading look from Frango, Basil decided to remain quiet and poured himself a cup of steaming hot tea. Mother Nature then turned to the head chef and head waiter, who were still rolling around on the floor near the kitchen doors, knocking bells out of each other. Taking a deep breath and rolling her eyes, she raised her hands and separated the warring duo leaving them levitating a couple of meters off the floor and just out of arm's reach. However, still drunk and enraged, the angry little chef wasn't going to let this minor inconvenience stop him from doing his best to land a sneaky punch on the waiter's head. Even though he couldn't reach his intended target, he lashed out uncontrollably. His actions were something an air dancer. <laughs> the wacky, inflatable waving two people usually found bouncing around outside car dealerships. You will stop this nonsense right this second or there will be dire consequences, said Mother Nature. With their black eyes and bruised lips, the head waiter and head chef suddenly found common ground. To, turning to Mother Nature, they said in unison, Come again? Mother Nature appeared to grow in her chair. Do not make me repeat myself. The head waiter was a little quicker to understand the threat and quickly shut up. The head chef, on the other hand, being an unhinged lunatic, exploded. It's my effing kitchen, he roared, and I am the effing head chef of this establishment, he protested, trying to rub some blood from his white jacket. Rangel covered his eyes and edged away. There was one line on the ledge that you never crossed. You never raised your voice and swore at Mother Nature. Since the beginning of time, there had only be ever been one administrator who had sworn at Mother Nature, and that particular honor had been bestowed upon Job Nigel. Over 300 years earlier, and for reasons unknown, Nutjob Nigel had tried to overthrow Mother Nature. He had climbed the steps to her cottage on Mother Mountain, smashed in her door, and entered her holy cottage with a barrage of profanities. It was later believed that he may have been suffering from Tourette's syndrome. Mother Nature and Frango were sitting in front of a roaring fire when the door suddenly flew across the front room. Once those naughty words filled her ear, she raised her left hand, flipped her finger, and Nutjob Nigel vanished. The insurgency had lasted eight minutes. Nutjob Nigel's disappearance led to a volley of conspiracy theories. Some said he had been sent to the underside of the ledge, but Administrator, Ford, uh, Administrator Push refuted this since he had no record of him going through the gate. Others claimed he was sent to Earth to live as a mere mortal, but the strongest theory, popular with the conspiracy theorists of today, 
was that much of now was simply removed from existence. If this, the theory, were proved to be true, much of now would be the only administrator to ever die on the ledge. Was nut job Nigel murdered was a popular topic of conversation in pub cellars and in darkened halls, away from prying eyes and ears. It could have been an act of nature, but then again, Mother Nature could have simply sent him to live thousands of miles away on top of a mountain in an unexplored region of the ledge. The great hall fell deathly silent and the atmosphere filled with dread. Mother Nature narrowed her eyes, pushing her chin down onto her neck. Wrangle noted the body language and knew that Grimsel Crochet, the head chef, was now in deep trouble. The torches on the wall flickered and died. The sudden darkness, but for the blasting fire, was dim and disturbing. Grimsel Crochet, you are no longer the head chef of this establishment. Fire flickered in Grimsel's brown eyes as it remained hanging in midair. His little frame began to shake with anger before he completely lost the plot, looking more like a turtle on its back as his arms and legs thrashed around. For fuck effing sake over my effing dead body, someone else running my kitchen don't effing think so. Wrangle sank further into his chair. Not only had Grimsel crossed the line, but he had now stepped back over it and crossed it again. Mother Nature sat up straight in her chair and let her glasses slide to the end of her nose. Frango, she whispered, loudly enough so Grimsel could hear, Did I hear correctly that Administrator Crochet wants us to go over his dead body? There was a definite push on the word dead. Yes, Mother Nature, you, you heard correctly, Frango replied as his he fidgeted it with his napkin. I see. And did Mr. Crochet swear at me? Frangle turned his eyes away from Mother Nature. I'm afraid he did. As the fog of rage finally started to subside in Grimsel's Crochet's mind, it began to dawn on him that he was in it knee deep, and it had hit the fan. Mother Nature continued. Frangle, be a dear and inform Administrator Hawthorne you are receiving a new guest. Shall I inform Adma Administrator Push of today's events? said Frangle, brightening up at the term of endearment. Yes, Frangle, excellent idea. If Administrator Crochet is not happy with his new accommodation in the fence, we can always see what Administrator Push can do for him. Rinsel Crochet was beginning to sweat. Now, let's be reasonable, he pleaded. I was only joking. Mother Nature stood up and waved her hand. I am being reasonable. Rinse of Crochet vanished in the theatrical puff of smoke that wasn't really necessary, but Mother Nature did so like the theater. Rinse's tall white chef's hat drifted to the floor and settled up by the swinging doors. It's dark in here, Frango. Do be a darling and light the torches. Mood, her mood lightened once more. Frango sloped off with a sigh. There were thirty-odd torches, and some of them were very high. Despondent as ever, and wondering why Mother Nature couldn't do it, he found a box of matches and started the long, tedious process of relighting all the torches. Mother Nature gazed towards the kitchen. Please ask Colin Collison to come forward, she said to the nearest person to the kitchen doors. As the indoor swung open, Colin was just about visible at a sink, deep in thought, and he appeared to be singing. We put the soap in the sink, and then we think, it's great to have a clean kitchen, and then we cook, never from the book, it's great to have a clean kitchen, and then we give the wife a good ass. <laughs> Stop right there. Oh, Stop right there, Colin, Derek spluttered and coughed just in time. Colin turned from the sink and looked out through the open door into the great hall. It was silent, everyone was staring into the kitchen and primarily at him. A nice tune, Colin, Zodiac said. Colin looked startled. Colin, please come forward, Mother Nature said, dismissing the potentially unsavory lyrics. 
Helen felt the collective penetrating stare of countless pairs of eyes bearing down on him as he walked towards the out door, pushed it open, and stepped out into the great hall. Spotting Grimsel's tall white chef's hat on the floor, he stooped down and picked it up. You are a chef, are you not? said Mother Nature. Yes, I am, Helen replied. Part time, Derek whispered under his breath. And you know your way around the kitchen? Colin nodded and Derek muttered. He knows his way to the fridge, and he shook with suppressed laughter. Colin, if Mr. and Basil would be grateful if you could lend your expertise for one night. Basil looked at Sash. Would I? Mother Nature caught his eye, and her face suggested that he would. But yes, of course, any help would be appreciated, said Basil, swiftly averting his eyes from Mother Nature. Good, it's settled then. Tonight, Colin, you are the head chef. Colin slowly slid the white cooking crown onto his head. It appeared to magically readjust, readjust to his head, loosening slowly to accommodate his ears. Colin then returned to the kitchen and felt a surge of aggressiveness, aggression he had never felt before. Administrator Grimsel Crochet was a small, thin, and very angry administrator who suffered from a disease that affects some height-restricted people, namely little man syndrome. His black, curly hair had, proceed, had receded, all part of Mother Nature's plan to emulate the people of Earth, revealing a rather large forehead, which was now glowing red, reflecting the fire that burned with, from within meters of him. Aha, my new guest. I have just received word of your imminent arrival, boomed Administrator Hothorns, Hothorns as he cracked his whip his mouth stretching to malevolent grin. He arches back even more than usual. After all, Grimsel was a special guest. It is not very often that we have honored we are honored with an administrator. They usually behave themselves. But do not fear, I have a special place for you. Uh, Hawthorne's pointed to the widest part of the canyon that was most difficult to bridge. The fire had just consumed the last wooden structure to the dismay of the tired, sweaty workers standing around the smoldering wreck. Little man syndrome, however, appears to penetrate all levels of common sense, and some people just never learn from their own mistakes. Grimsel was guilty of this, and as usual, anger got the better of him. F and F you, he screamed. Undeterred by Grimsel's expletive, the Mr. Hawthorne's ran his fingers through his thick green hair. His grin extended even wider and cracked his whip, which wrapped itself around Grimsel's body. He then coiled the rest of his whip around Grimsel and pulled the ex-chef towards his face. Grimsel was now so close to the administrator of torture that he could smell Hawthorne's minty, fresh breath. Grimsel tried to move his hands, but the coil was so tight they were glued to his hips. Hawthorns pushed his nose into Grimsel's and grinned like a Cheshire cat. He held the pose for a further couple of seconds and then gave the whip a hard tug. Grimsel spun from its coil like a whirlwind, crashing along the valley floor and spinning past open fires and the astonished residents of the canyon until he finally rotated into the work area where they made the legs for the wooden bridges. Do enjoy your stay. I believe you will be here for quite some time. Hawthorne's boomed as he floated away to the sounds of Grimsel's cursing. Hmm, Colin, this is fantastic. What is it? said Derek, filling his face with what looked like Toad in the Hole. Colin folded his arms and held his head up high. Following Grimsel's self-inflicted departure, Colin, with unhelpful help from Basil, had reorganized the kitchen and restored order. Everyone had been instructed on how to use the doors properly, and Basil's microphone, megaphone had been destroyed. It's Colin's culinary delight, Colin said. He felt odd. The agitation he had felt earlier was becoming more annoying. Look, even Mother Nature appears to be enjoying it, said Reg. Well, it's bloody lovely, said Barry, with gravy smeared around his mouth. I could do with a coffee, though. Colin ushered one of the waiters into the kitchen. He soon reappeared with a white frothing cup of hot coffee. Wow, that was quick! Colin smiled, but then an angry grimace crossed his face. 
A clean kitchen is an efficient kitchen. Now I must go and prepare dessert. And Colin strode off with a tea towel draped over his shoulder. Hey, did you hear about the Italian chef who died? Derek announced to the table before dissolving into a fit of giggles as he struggled to deliver the punchline in his best Italian accent. He passed away! Stan laughed. Woohoo! Very good, Derek. Bloody hell, Stan, don't encourage him, said Barry with a groan. After the dessert had been served, Colin finally sat down and ate his meal. His normally laid-back persona had been pricked to, by something ugly. Once he had finished, he headed back into the kitchen. Hey, Colin, where are you going? asked Eric. Colin spun round quickly, angrily, that he had to answer the question. Clearing up! The clean kitchen is a safe kitchen, he snapped. But it's 11 o'clock and we race in the morning, said Derek. And? Colin was proud, a proud chef, and it was then instilled in him to leave the kitchen clean and tidy, ready for the next meal. However, that odd feeling was now becoming overwhelming. It won't take long, he grunted. His moods had turned dark. Abruptly, Colin spun on his heels and plowed into the kitchen, through the swing indoor, where he was presented with a stack of plates, pots and pans, and almost, that almost touched the ceiling. He shuddered and thought, Yes, to that. He waved his hand from side to side in deep thought until eventually he spotted a kitchen hand who was hopefully might receive some help and who had just started to tackle the first mini mountain of crockery. Colin then barked a random order and headed off towards a little office at the back of the huge kitchen where he pulled up a little wooden chair only a chef would find comfortable and sat down. As he raised his hands to remove the sacred crown from his head, a suppressed voice from deep within the dark corners of his mind, alien in origin, screamed at him not to. Colin obliged and left the tall white cursed hat on his head. He then reached into a drawer under a small desk and found what he was looking for. The little chef's bottle of strong alcohol. There was one in every kitchen and Colin had found Grimsel's scotch whiskey. Leaning back and resting his chair against the wall, he put his feet up and enjoyed several shots of whiskey. Once half the bottle had been consumed, he became rather aggressive and began arguing with himself and anyone who dared to go to near the little office. He soon tired and began to yawn. The next morning, as the sun crept up over the horizon, its golden rays filled the hotel rooms of the castle, waking Reg, who had been sleeping on the window ledge. He had heard about the ghost of a virgin bride that had visited the hotel from time to time, how she managed this without rigor mortis knowing was a complete mystery. And he had decided to keep a keen eye on the courtyard in the hope of engaging her in conversation. As the first spikes of the golden ray tinkled in his eyes, he howled softly. The rays inched across the floor until they stumbled upon Stan, who was doing press-ups silently on the floor next to his bed, still made from the night before. Reg pushed opened the window, allowing professionally cool air to slither in. It was a perfect morning, and Raj was already enjoying it. From a second-floor window, he had spotted a couple of chamois that had wandered into the courtyard. Basil had forgotten to raise the drawbridge. A wave of satisfying peace overwhelmed him until the rays of sunshine stretched into the far corner of the room and disturbed the third member who was now stirring in his bed. <coughs> it was followed by a little fart. Good morning, Barry, Reg said without moving his head. Good night, Skip. Barry nodded and sat up, rubbing his eyes. He then fumbled around, looking for his glasses. Parting again, Barry swung his legs out of the bed and onto the floor, where he had been then tripped over Stan. Sorry, Stan, didn't see you down there, Barry said with a puzzled look. As his ever-present obsession with the weather started to wake up, he moved across to the window and looked out. Looking good out there. Stan quickly bounced up. Woohoo, sun! And he started doing sit-ups. Having logged his weather report, the next thing on Barry's list was food. The rumbling on his stomach ignited a caveman instinct to drop everything and take on some sustenance as soon as humanly possible. 
They would be just in trouble if you didn't eat at the correct time. I need to eat now, Barry announced, hopping on one leg while trying to slide the other into his biker shorts. Down in the dining room, the roaring fire of the previous night was now a whimper of ash and smoke, but the atmosphere was electric as everyone was anticipating the long descent of the mountain. Sunlight poured through the small windows of the spectacular hall and rested upon the long wooden tables and the cyclists, bar one, who were enjoying their breakfast. Where's Colin? Austin asked. Eric sighed, I'll give you one guess. He was up at 5.30, insisting that he had to go get the kitchen ready. Kept telling him that he doesn't work here, but he wouldn't listen. He didn't get into bed until going to this morning, and he'd been drinking. He even slept with that bloody chef's hat on. Oh, does he know we have a race today? Derek shook his head as a father, father would over a son who had disappointed him. Oh, woo! Great breakfast, though, said Reg, tearing through a thick slice of bacon. Derek looked around the table. How's things with you, Bernard? Bernard was looking a little more serious than usual. He looked somewhat jaded, which for Bernard was a concern. Things are okay, but I am a bit tired. Austin was making strange little beeping noises in the night. Was I? Austin replied, almost choking on a piece of sausage. Yes. Austin shrugged. Must have been an upscale. Everyone upright, beg your pardon. Everyone turned towards the kitchen as Colin burst out of the double swinging doors, swearing at a waiter. It seems the curse of the chef's hat was now effect, had now affected Colin, said Barry calmly as he slurped his coffee. Happy now he had eaten. Derek put his head in his hands. It was going to be a long day. After breakfast, the teams gathered of their belongings together and headed towards the start line, where they waited for the penultimate stage to begin. This was going to be a brute. The route comp comp comprised a second 70-mile mountain stretch of tarmac that started with a 10-mile twisting descent down the other side of the Culver Ridge Show before passing through Dweller's Tunnel and continuing for 30-odd miles through the Valley of Darkness, after which the road began to twist the Caldy Shredder. Shredder. On reaching the summit, the route became the fast ascent down the mountain and out to Pleasant Moorland, finally ending in the fishing port of Ketchum High, which sat probably by the Sea of Biscuits, one of the seas of the ledge. Ezra stood on a box at the start line with his battered, broken microphone in his hand. Riders, are you ready? He boomed. Uh, silence. Riders, are you ready? He boomed. Silence. Again, he was met by a wall of silence. Dejected, Basil dropped the megaphone on the floor and whispered, Riders, are you ready? A chorus of replies ensued. The general consensus being, Shut up and get on with it. Even Mother Nature was becoming restless. Just bloody well get on with it, will you? Clayton sneered impatiently. Derek looked at his watch. Where in a pot of gold is Colin? Uh, woo, he's still in the kitchen. I'll go get him, said Bernard, st stepping down off his bike. Moments later, a clatter cr and crash of pots and pans filled the air as Bernard carried a reluctant column over his shoulder out of the kitchen and placed him on his bike at the start line. Cowan was furious. His face was angry shade of red that you would find on any known color chart. He pro his protests were met with little sympathy. Leaving a cap kitchen halfway through a shift was plentiful with stale garlic on the end of a stick. Shut up your nether, nether regions. He tried several times to return to his post, only for Bernard to secure him to his bike. His hand clamped on Colin's shoulder. And so, with the enthusiasm of a cat in a shower, Basil waved the Col de Grosso flag, a purple flag bearing the image of a castle, and the race was on. Cheering the administrators deafened the riders as they accelerated away from the hotel and headed down the steep pass. So that's another one. I will be checking with Steve and see if we can get some more readings done, see if we can agree on 
another fun one, but uh, that's a fun book. And uh, next time we'll be reading uh, from Joe, uh, Joe's Journey, and then we'll be doing another one of mine. Um, the uh, guild took a few trips to uh, when they were to the seven wonders of, of the uh, ancient world, and I'll read about. I think they're uh, when they go to one of the temples of Atlas. I think that was Francis's trip, so it'll be kind of fun to read. And I look forward to seeing you again uh, next time. Thank you again for visiting with me. And next, uh, if you have any comments, I'd really like to hear them, critiques, things you like, things you don't like, books that you have read that you'd like to read out here, books that you have written that you'd like to include in my uh, readings. That would be very nice, and I would appreciate uh, anybody who'd like to uh, have me do their reading their book on here. It's always fun to introduce a new uh, book on this. So thank you again for visiting, and I hope to see you again next, uh, next reading.